Jesse? It was a very scary, very scary project, very scary picture. Do not try to call or signal anyone. If you do, I will kill your daughter, not because I want to, but because those are the rules. Daddy! Well, I think it would be every parent's nightmare. You want what they want. They know that you know the number. They're going to kill my little girl. You don't tell Stop the it. number. Stop it. Get out of here. Bring her. It's a lot of twists and turns and, and uh, exciting stuff. You set me up, Lewis. Yeah. He's keeping Sarah hostage. What do we got? Load up, female, no ID. I work homicide, Dr. Zach. That's Sarah. More. It's a classic Hitchcock. A fable. A telephone number? No. An address? No. An account? I don't know. It's a bank account? No. Is it a code? No. Is it a place? No. What is it? No! I love the idea of having two and three storylines coalescing in the second act into a, a pretty amazing third act. You're not like me, Nathan. Kill the man who took my little girl. Police, don't move! You say goodnight to mom? Night, mommy. Mm. Mm. For my taste, a thriller is only as good as, as the people uh, you care about in the picture. Only two now. Things really moved very quickly in the film, and at the same time, the notion of family wasn't lost. Daddy! If you don't care, if you don't engage, you then the film has no meaning. Go to bed now? Let's <laughs> cut it! Good job. We show to the audience that we're a very close-knit unit, a family that loves each other very much. Hey, baby. Mm -hmm. Honey, don't go anywhere. I'll be right back. Michael Douglas is a, a wonderful actor. I mean, that, that's a given. I don't even have to say that. Everybody knows that. He's extremely professional. He's wonderful to work with. I think Michael walks on screen with, um, like the way John Wayne and Gary Cooper does, with a, a fantastic degree of persona and, and also an, and kind of great baggage. Welcome. I always try to keep a, um, a comfortable environment on the set anyway. I just think people work much better when they're relaxed. He's very giving and... Uh, I feel very fortunate to have been cast as his wife in this film. Go say goodnight to Mom. Good night. Night, Mommy. The actress who plays my mom, Famke Janssen, she's real nice. Famke Janssen playing Aggie Conrad cannot leave her bed. You know, she is in a very, very volatile, dangerous situation, and one where she's completely helpless. Here's Superwoman lying in bed and she works out all the time and you know she's just in control of everything and i just wanted to make her very human there's a scene where i she has to play the game boy and she said i'm so bad at this it's not good fun. please help me out and i said i'll i'll teach you we ended up playing game boy and she actually taught me because of course i don't know how to play that either but she's still not that good <laughs> you have to be able to improvise when different things happen and sky was great for that too and i think sky when we had our first reading uh, was the one that impressed all of us the most. She's not smug. There's no arrogance to it. There's simply a sense that she's just she's a smart kid. And it's really quite amazing to watch. I wish we had some cheeseburgers. We have these they're kind of cute little scenes. I'm trying to not get attached to her, and she just starts picking me apart. It's that thing on your neck. She's pushing every one of my buttons. It's kind of impolite not to answer someone's question. And I end up, you know, just about end up singing, singing along. She's singing a song. You like country music? Mm-hmm. The best thing about that is I really am a singer. Pink toenails. How am I gonna get pink toenails? And I'm just like, la-da-dee, la-da-da. <laughs> Elizabeth Burroughs. Gary and I must have seen, I don't know, 30 or, or 40 young women. Brittany Murphy walked into a meeting with us and just blew us away. It was mainly the character that drew me to the story. It kind of jumps off the page and into my arm and somehow into my body. I just know somehow I'm fortunate enough to know and if you trust your instincts, then things work out the way they're supposed to. Our hand movements, uh, playing this girl that was supposedly disturbed, with no coaching at all,
she was the girl that we were thinking about. The key to the picture is the fact that Brittany Murphy's character, Elizabeth, is that maybe she's not quite as disturbed as, as they think she is. You're very, very good at what you do. The mixture of, of rage and madness and vulnerability was just, it's, you can't act that. It's sort of in your soul. You I know who this. they were, you what they please. wanted. And now I do. Please. I know how bad they wanted it. Please. I know how please. important it was for you to hold on to. Please. She's a wonderfully talented young actress in the unique habit of uh, sort of singing just before each take. Like it was very kind to ask if it bothered me, and I said no. Yeah, I know. Well, I'm trying to go for a B camera, too. So. I think one of the most challenging scenes in the film, which I'm also most proud of in the end of the day, is the, is the subway sequence where Brittany Murphy goes back to the subway in Canal Street and relives the death of her father. I tried to keep my pizza going. I really felt that, that what made the se sequence work was a performance by, by Brittany Murphy in recounting the event, both in the moment but also to sort of be suspended in time. And also the, the performance completely unwritten and improvised by Sean Doyle, who plays her father. My dad took me around the corner. You know, there's a lot of pushing and shoving, and then there's all the action of me falling and getting hit and everything, but Gary made sure that there were moments when there was actual contact, connection to the daughter, so that the audience is left with the last times that the daughter saw her father alive. Okay, listen to me, okay? You and me, you gotta wait right here. Right here, no matter what. It's gonna be all right. It's gonna be fine. Right here. It's not just about making a thriller. It's about hopefully making a great movie. The core of a thriller working is to care about your protagonists. If you don't, then why bother? You know, everything else from there is simply window dressing. I mean, the cool camera moves and the music and, and the cutting patterns, it all comes down to, do you care? What's important, and don't say a word, is the film has to have a great deal of texture. I want to get away from that kind of glossy, monochromatic, kind of sleek finish that's become sort of in vogue in commercials and film. You know, I mean, I love the work that's been done in the last few years in, in film, but it's become, to me, too much, too luminescent and too clean. Nice speed. 35 Baker, take one, eight camera only, and mark. Action. Come on, sweetheart. But he told, I have to, I have to, he told me to stay. He told me, to, Dr. Sachs, he Nelson told and I always stay. begin by saying, what's the film we're making? Let's always have kind of a gothic feel in the picture. And all of a sudden, you know, the, the Bellevue, Bridgeview, we, uh, which originally was like linoleum floors, fluorescent lights, drywall, all of a sudden became tile floors, you know, terracotta. Um, it became peeling paint. It became archways. 35 Charlie, take two. Bravo camera only marker. What's with the heavy artillery? Took, um, took five gentlemen to... Get him off the pork. Ooh, ha, ha. Ooh, ha, ha, ha. Sorry. Action. It's really an organic process where you sort of begin finding a commonality in the language. And, and to me, seeing is an, as understanding. You know, he shows me photographs. He shows me images. He shows me location scout photos. And we begin to find the picture. Okay. Let's cut it. We cut that. I think we should, we should loosen at the end. We should, mm -hmm. uh, maybe after. Yeah, just a little step to the left, guys. And we'll go again. You know, I think it really works. For me, even, for example, in this movie, I found myself really attracted to Larry Clark's um, photography books, like Tulsa. And something about the idea of a mentally disturbed woman, but who also had humanity, is in Larry Clark's work. It's not supposed to happen. True catatonics have what's called a waxy flexibility of their limbs. That means they stay. Something exactly. really heartbreaking about these images. And I, I, I found myself Xeroxing and putting on my office, in my production office, all these images of Larry Clark's work. And it really influenced me. And I think that Nelson would walk in and see that. And it, be it becomes osmosis, too, you know? And, Again, not plagiarism, but it becomes kind of part of the fabric of the uh, discussion. Yeah. It's a cut. 192 Delta, take one, B only. Mark. And action. 
Making films is, is, is two parts of the process. One is, is having the vision in your head, and two is communicating the vision. It's finding a way to, to tell people what you see. Elizabeth, what do you see? There were lots of people. But my dad just pushed through them. Shooting the film is like going to war in some way. It really is this very civilized battle constantly, where you're always battling the elements, battling the weather, battling schedules, battling the people being sick, battling people's needs. And you're recording this stuff on film forever. So you're battling the fact that this is going to be a permanent record of that day's events. My favorite part of the process is, is post-production. If you can shoot enough great stuff, in 65 days or 40 days or 35 days, you can go off and you can make the film. And I love sitting with just the two guys in the room for about 10 weeks, 12 weeks, and finding the movie. They're still behind us. But now only two men. We lost one. If you have different choices, you can modulate a performance. You can make it more strident or more sort of voce. You can, you can sort of change rhythms. You can change an intention if you have the choices in the cutting room. <laughs> Elizabeth, what did the man want? What did the man want, Elizabeth? <laughs> This film was fantastic because we really saw things come to life. Where scenes that by themselves did not really work, all of a sudden, when inter intercut with two other scenes, they became amazing. I think I heard John Favreau say this last week in, in some lecture. He said that it's a great quote that uh, filming is like is like shopping for groceries, and editing is like preparing the meal. You know, I've heard people say to me, "Gee, I could tell it was your film. I could tell your style right away." But I think if I could tell my style, I'd become I would I'd implode. I wouldn't know what my style is. Your primary goal as a director with an actor is to make the actor feel safe. That is the bottom line. You can distill any actor's style. Actor could be instinctual, could be method. Whatever the style is, it comes down to the actor needing to feel safe and feel protected. And once the actor feels all those things, he or she can, can do their best work. Uh, I think every actor is different. I mean, some actors who come from theater that require rehearsal and want ten takes to rehearse and warm up on film. That's, that's, that's a acceptable style. There are actors who like to do it in one take or two takes. It doesn't make, make it wrong, it just means that that's how they work. So I think that your, your job, again, vis-a-vis -vis the point of, of an actor feeling safe, is how does an actor like to work? As, as you shoot more film, you learn to rely more on and hope more for surprises and things that sort of just happen, and for moments that seem real, the, ac the happy accidents. If you can be open to the accidents, if you can be open to those, those moments, the film can be, can be enriched. What Brittany Murphy brought to the picture uh, on a daily basis was, was always the most surprising. There wasn't a day where she didn't, she didn't uh, make the material better by changing something, by changing it rhythmically, the intention, the inflection. And, f you know, the idea that, that she began singing in, in that second scene with Michael Douglas when she's, he walks in and she's singing Dream Little Dream, not scripted, not discussed really, and she began singing it, and I said, well, let's, you know, I tell you, me five years ago, I would have said to her, what are you doing? We haven't got the rights to that song, and you can't be singing. I would have been much more controlling. And now I, I was like saying, well, this is pretty interesting, and it's pretty haunting. So we did the take with, take without, and I found that it, it, it kind of grew on me. And that, that singing, that song, became part of the narrative. We literally made it, made it, she did it again and again, and then in the third act of the picture, you realize that the singing connects to the father. Michael Douglas brings to this movie incredible credibility and weight. And I'll tell you something, in that first screening of the film, your first preview, and, and Michael walks on camera, the audience, they, they just they kind of go, oh yeah, this is a Michael Douglas movie. One of my biggest fears in the movie was he's playing a guy that you have to like. And, you know, though I, I embrace Michael's ambiguity in his persona, and I love the complexity of his persona, I also was, was worried that I want to make sure that in the, the first act of the picture, you really embrace him as a normal guy, a little bit of loving family, and I think that he did that. The little moments in the film, like Michael cooking breakfast, making the French toast, the way he talks to his kid, putting her to sleep, the way he, he interacts with his wife, it just it felt so organic and so real to me. And you can see the day we shot it, he's got that gift, he can just he can connect like that.
So I think Michael, and Michael also brings, this is an external thing, he brings an incredible professionalism to the set. He brings a standard. When they come on the set, everyone's at their best. Everyone's on their best behavior and also doing their best work because we have, everyone's very focused. And to me, that taught me a lesson about if you're, if you're the head guy, if you're a leader, people really respond to your energy and to your, your focus. And Michael does that. A film can be made or lost in pre-production. Pre-production is about, is about getting rid of the surprises and the compromises. And that's why I like to do storyboarding on action scenes or any kind of visual effects scenes, because storyboards mean this is the frame. It may, it may not be a perfect frame, but you know, here are the elements in the frame, here are the extras, here's the actor. So storyboarding, discussions, production meetings, and the big thing is scouting locations. Scouting locations, by the way, is one of the most painful things to do. If you talk to anybody on film sets, it's the most tedious thing. You drive in a van for hours and days, and you go to these locations, talk about lights go here and cameras go there. But I'll tell you something, when you come to the set the day of shooting, you're happy you've done it. Staging a scene in a movie is, is always very precarious. Every day you go to the set with some butterflies about how it'll go that day. I've learned that unless you're doing an action sequence where you have to literally have the camera and actor coordinate in a certain way, I like to give the actors in a dramatic scene um, kind of a sketch. I'll tell them that morning, look, you know, I, I, here's, here's a sketch. I think that you come in the door this way, go to the desk over there, rifle through the papers, you don't find what you want, you go back over there. You can kind of end up against the window, that'd be great because we have light coming in there and you kind of shimmy the thing and then the, and it opens and then you go back over there. I, I tend to give the actors enough latitude to embellish and to improve. And, you know, what, you, what you're hoping is the actor goes, you know what, I, I see that, but what if I did this? And you go, yeah, well, that's, that's pretty great. I will say a great example of that is the scene when Michael first meets Brittany Murphy in her, in her room. I had this vision that there had to be this image, which is one of my favorite shots in the movie, where, where Michael's holding her hand, taking her pulse. And there's a very symmetrical two shot. <clears throat> it's a very tense frame. Him to the left and her to the right. And they're both very still. And it's sort of framed in a way, it just feels very much like anything could happen at any second. And again, that's a case where I said, I want to end up here. Can you, can you guys help me get there? Can you guys help me get to this place? And the actors usually will be very happy to, to help you get there. You know, my, my first movie, Dead in Denver, I was so, my insecurity made me much more rigid. You know, I was much more about, you know, wanting to show that I knew exactly what was happening and the actor comes, the, the character comes in here and stands right there at this counter, at this stool, and then turns that way on that line. And, I felt it was my way of showing I was prepared. In fact, it showed that I was ill-prepared because my, my, my prepar over preparation gave a sense of certain claustrophobia to the, to the process. My single best advice to wannabe filmmakers, to wannabe directors, is to have the ego to do it, is to have the commitment to yourself. I always say to them, when you're in your 20s and your early 30s and you have the, and you have the focus and the time, is, is make the effort. I think now more than ever with, with digital video and, and uh, home editing systems and Final Cut Pro and Macintosh and, and again, you know, DV films being made left and right, I think that it's now easier than ever to just, to just do it. You have to direct if you want to direct. And I also think that just directing, you get better. You know, by talking about it for five years, you can't improve as a filmmaker. You have to make films to get better as a filmmaker. And for, for myself, every short film I made in high school and college and grad school, Every TV show I did in 1992, 93, 94 made me better for the next one. You know, I mean, I'm the filmmaker I am now because of the films I did before this, and the films I'll do next will be better because of the films I did last year. So I think that just sheer, like, like being a pilot, hours behind the wheel, man, you know, just uh, keep shooting those films. So what's it like to be a producer? Yeah, we're, we're asked that all the time. Everyone always asks, anime, what does a producer do? Uh, there are really many different types of producers. There's executive producers, producers, associate producers, line producers, um, co-producers, co-producers, executive in charge of production, the line producer. He's the guy that when you need trucks on Wilshire, Avenue, Wilshire Boulevard and um, whatever cross street at four in the morning, he's going to be there. We're not going to be there because we are more into the creative end and the, the actual on-set production, working with the director and working with the actors. So there's a myriad of titles, but it's the real producer that stays with it that does the work. Anne and I are really producers. It means that from the very inception of the basic idea, we hear a pitch, we acquire 
a novel, we acquire a script, we hire a director, we work on the script with a writer until we can get the stars. In the case of Don't Say a Word, we worked on the scripts, scripts for many years and attempted to have Michael Douglas be interested in the project from the time that we acquired the project. But once, but, but once you get to the point where you can get a major star and a director, then you're involved in the physical production. You're hiring a crew. If you're a true producer, you are involved in every aspect of the production. You're on set during the shooting. You're conferring with your director. You, you have forged a partnership, if you will, with your director. This is the relationship that Anne and I had with Gary Fleeter right from the beginning. We were a team. We were there to support him. Uh, we're there in moments of crisis. There's a crisis every day in the shooting of a movie. And then when you finally finish it, we're involved in post-production. Uh, we go to the editing room if, if the director is secure. And Gary is one of those secure directors where we went into the editing room with him. Uh, we give him our thoughts concerning the final cut of the movie. Uh, we're involved in the selection of the composer. Uh, we're involved in the campaign. Uh, and then we finally get a completed film. Then you go to test market it. We're there. So we're, we're involved. We're involved in every conceivable part of the producing and the distribution of the movie. So it's a, it's a multifaceted role that a producer who is an involved producer has to do. Uh, we like the, um, the big thriller, the one with the, the major actor, uh, ones with twists and turns in the screenplay. Uh, the one we just did is a great example. Uh, Don't Say a Word is a thriller that we're extremely proud of. We acquired the book approximately 12 years ago. And, and, and I put up our own money which was an extraordinary thing to do at the time. We had no studio deal. Uh, we didn't have any way of recouping this money. We put up $250,000 and we bought the book. And we carried it and we developed it for two years. We then approximately two years later made a, um, an overall deal with Warner Brothers. Um, we were making our first movie, I think, with Warners. And in the middle of the night, the president of production came out to Brooklyn uh, to be on the set, and I was on the way back into Manhattan with him in a limo, and I felt since I had 45 minutes, I was going to sell this book to him. And uh, he couldn't go anywhere. He couldn't get out of the limo, and I nailed him before we got to his hotel, and he agreed to buy it. And then Arnon and Milchen's company, Regency, uh, came into the uh, co-financing, so we did that for a couple of years. And then Milchen left, and he bought out uh, Warner Brothers. But we were attached to the project. And then we continued developing it with Arnon. And our Regency, when they agreed to make Don't Say a Word, they brought in the company that co-finances movies. Coincidentally, the president of which is the guy in the limo that I sold it to 10 years ago. So it was a reuniting of many people that had worked on the project. That very much believed in the project right from the beginning and just had to stick with it and have persistence and determination in getting it to be acceptable to us and to a NA actor such as Michael Douglas. And Douglas was always involved. He read the first draft of the script. He said, I like it very much, but your third act isn't right. And once you start unraveling a project, you just can't focus on a third act. You're back to a page one rewrite which has happened many times on, on this project. So, and that's it, and the, the years slip by, and before you know it, you're into 12 years. Distinguishing our credit of producer from maybe someone else's credit as a producer, an executive producer uh, sometimes gets that title. Uh, if it were an independent production, he might be putting up the money. Uh, it might be an actor uh, that says, I won't, I won't do the movie unless I get executive producer credit. Or a manager who gets credit on behalf of the actor. We've seen that, and we, we are really opposed to that, of people just getting credit and not doing the work. I think a great producer or producers are people who have a lot of passion and determination to get a project done. And they do whatever they need to do to make a movie happen, whether it's to work on the script, to acquire 
the talent to, to meet with the director. We believe having great passion for the making of movies, I think we owe it not only to ourselves, but for the people that are putting up these gigantic sums of money, I think we have to give them um, the best we can give them, and that is being involved in all aspects of the, the job to be done. There are so many aspects of movie making. It is such a collaborative type of trailers. work Visita that mi canal. you really, whatever we're doing at that moment is what we enjoy the most. I think visualizing the venture, coming up with an idea, uh, putting on a writer, getting a script that carries forth what you wanted to see, and then you eventually shoot it and it comes out right, and you see lines four blocks long, and the critics love your movie. This is a tremendous high. It doesn't get better than that.